Now, I'm going to talk about software memories and simulated machines. And uh, some of the drivers for the talk is the calls. We have mobile, mobile systems, Internet of Things, microservices, continuous delivery, usable infrastructure. Now, what you'll notice on the left hand side is what we have is many more but smaller systems. That's what we seem to be doing, miniaturization. The, the problem for, in terms of management, uh, when we look at mobility and the Internet of Things, we want observation of what's going on because to manage or to monitor what people are doing, you simply need to watch the machines because the machines are in fact a proxy or a delegate for human interaction. Everything we're doing now is done uh, through devices. Microservices is people want to partition everything up for resilience, isolation. But we, in terms of monitoring, we want our management, our understanding, we want consolidation. Uh, continuous delivery, uh, there's a lot of change happening and it's, con and it's changing at a very fast rate. The problem there is that we're always in the past. So what we need to do is focus on recollection. We're always viewing the, uh, the viewing the past, and we need better ways of looking at the past. Now, because when we, we look at monitor, we always think we're looking live, but in fact, now it's much more obvious that anytime you look at production, you don't know what production looks like because it could have changed 15 minutes ago. And the thing is that we don't have this ability to build up a memory of what production is meant to look like because it's constantly changing. Now, for that, what we need is some way of doing differentiation because we, we're also then applying many images on hardware and we're expecting similar behavior but maybe there are certain machines that even though they have the same image they're not acting the same way and we need the infrastructure to be able to determine whether there are rogue agents out there. So anyway Gartner had a report came out with cognizant computing they said a bit in terms of what we've done ourselves with machines, so man to machine, we went from personal computing, smart, 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 smartphones, personal cloud, and then we have personal agents. This is where, so we have a pendulum where we go from find server then to everything on the device and bring it back to this distributed systems again. And what's going to happen is that so we've put the cloud where it knows us now, and we're going to probably go to personal agents where our code is not just executing on devices, but the devices are communicating with backend agents which are communicating with the machines on our behalf and giving us notifications, with smart notifications of what's happening in the cloud. So for how with machines now, I, what I want to do is have machines act like people. Machines to, act, to see each other and to, for machines to manage each other. So if taking that and bringing cognizant machines, we would have the old way was the logging people viewed systems via the log file, what was in the log file was what happened, even though that could, no one ever test what actually is logged. Then we had the CME, which is application monitoring, where we started to measure systems, we wanted to see the behavior. Then what we have at the moment in the industry is software analytics. I don't think, I mean, it's being promoted that way. I don't think we've got to that. But that's the phase where the machines are meant to know what it is. But following what we expected to happen is the systems, the machines have become very self-adaptive. They start to alter their behavior. System dynamics becomes very important in engineering. Feedback control becomes more explicit in managing engineering systems. And we have adaptive signals where the machines start to send signals to each other to alter their behavior. Now, how does a, a person, how does a person like myself become a superhero or a superman? Well, I could take steroids, but I probably wouldn't still be able to fly. But what we do is we actually go on gaming and we become like Assassin's Creed. We go back in time and we become those heroes in those worlds. We suddenly have these new capabilities. And it feels great. I mean, this is what gamers are here. We like that interaction. We like this new capabilities. So if a machine was to become like us, machines would want to also be able to project themselves into a game. So machines are actually going to have a simulation. Machines are going to mirror themselves over into their own world, their own creation, and then the, that world is going to be like the matrix, but the matrix for machines. So the, now, uh, this has, there's a lot of slides, I've just cut them down so that they're not kind of flowing. <laughs> and so we have memory models. So what we want is humans have a memory of system, the two basic memories, episodic memory is what did you do, what's your events like, and then the semantic memory is what does the world look like. Semantic memory is more like CMDBs, configuration management, what is the state of systems. Episodic memory is what did I do yesterday, what do I do, when I do something, what does it feel like. We want machines to be able to have a memory that's event-based. You say, 
oh, I remember what I did, and I remember how that felt like. And in fact, I can dream. And like, so why were dreams invented, or why did dreams come about in our evolution? Because they primed our responses for the next day when something attacked us. And we didn't go into a state of shock, we already had, had a dream on it, and we would have then figured out, or at least the, the, our control systems, or our motor systems, would have had a better ability to react. So dreaming is a way of training systems, so we need software to dream. And Blade Runner, that's in fact what they did, they gave memories to machines, and we need to do that. Now, it's, in managing systems, one of the theories that we have in cybernetics is every good regulator of a system must be a model of the system. So all doing is knowing. So in fact, you, to be able to know someone, you have to be them. You have to, it's a bit like, if you want to know that person, you have to act them or you have to feel them. And in fact, for humans or for anybody to, you can't really know what, what another person unless you do the similar actions or you have the ability to do the actions that they have. And that's why it's a bit like hypnotism. If, you've never, if you don't know what the word hypnotism means, you can't be hypnotized. So that has to, that's the, it's a suggestion. And you do that, you don't know what it is because you don't know hypnotism. So you have to have a knowledge of it and you have the ability to act. So what we want is, and humans have mirror neurons in their brain, which, so when I'm looking at all of you, I've actually got a mini you inside of me running around simulating. I'm thinking, okay, that person's looking at me a certain way. I don't like to look at that. And I can see the actions. So, and, and so I'm, I'm using not what you're communicating, because you're not communicating to me, but you're, they're still, I'm picking up signals, and that's your actions. So we, and, I'm, and how I understand or how I have empathy for someone is because I feel already them. I can relate to them, and I can relate to them because I, I, I merge my own neurons or my own mechanism in my, inside my brain with the representation that I see. So humans understand other humans by creating mirrors. Officially, so, the seven minutes is up. Oh, that's awesome. You have three minutes. <laughs> Cassandra's an OSQL system, I'm going to run it up. Before I run it up, I'm going to run up a process. So when I talk about machines here, in fact, I'm talking about software machines. And I'm going to run up a Cassandra system. And this is, well, I'm not running up Cassandra. This is an application. It's just a normal process that's able to, uh, to mimic another machine. And then I'm going to run up a real machine. And I'm now going to connect the console. Now this monitoring console is can only connect to both processes and it actually thinks both processes. This is the simulation system. You can see sims here and the code is running in here. And inside of the, the Cassandra, the same thing is happening. What I've got is a machine mirroring another machine. So think about like a dancer, you go to a dance club, you look at a dancer, you do the moves, but you're not the dancer. You're still mimicking the other machine. I'm not changing the world, the transactions are not happening twice, but I'm mimicking. So when a mime artist on the street cleans a window, he's cleaning a window in terms of how we see action, but is he cleaning a window? No. We know, there's no window here. <laughs> okay? So, so we're going to do this. Uh, the window's there, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm going to now run, I'm going to now run up a simulation, but this time the simulation, I'm going to run it with an extension that says, bring the main, so I'm now going to bring up a simulation that says, I'm a simulation, I've got this extension inside me that says, I look at what's happening in this world and I'll create a, a matrix visualization. And when something connects to, because this is a simulation, it actually only oh, mimics another machine. machine. And now I'm going to run Cassandra, which is going to connect. It's going to project itself over. And in the simulation, each of those columns is a thread, and that's a stack frame. The code that's happening at the moment, as it goes pushing and popping, is actually what's happening live in that other machine. And I come to now do a transaction system that hits the Cassandra, and you can see that there's stuff happening. We actually are now able to observe the system by looking at a simulation that's mimicking the other system. What's useful in that is that once you're able to project your image over into another machine, there's no reason why. So we just kill Cassandra. Oh. Yeah. 
And what I'm going to then do is, I'm going to say, well, it would be great if I could see that all again. And I'm going to now run up. So while that was running, the, the projection was coming over and the simulation was saving the memory. And it's a memory that could be altered. So now I'm going to run it again. And this is a script that just says, take a memory. And, um, take a memory. So all it is going to say is, take this file and play it back. And this is in the simulation. Cassandra's not running. And this is the simulation that was happening there. It's starting up earlier than the last time because I switched over there. But you can see this is a simulation. The reads, the inserts will happen shortly. So in fact, the machine is able to dream again. It's able to replay. And I can even say, dream it with a different view called stripes, which is kind of like the simulation. But this time, we do something different with the graphics. And it comes out like that. So we can actually always li relive uh, time. Uh, now, just a quick, so another thing is we can also make, I know I'm really pushing it. <laughs> really? <laughs> but I just thought first, okay, I've got a client UI, this is a machine that says I do code that moves a ball, but I'm actually projecting the pixels over into that machine. This is a simulation. Now, this is a code that says every time it, this simulation sees a machine doing stuff, it says, hey, that looks like a ball moving. It's not pixels, it's looking at code moving. And then it's going to, and now I'm going to bring up the client again. I've got two clients. Now, each client doesn't know about the other one, but the simulation sees the two of them because the simulation is like the matrix. I wait to see what happens when they connect to each other, so we can have a collective intelligence where we can see where they, they're just about to hit each other. Hopefully, go on. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 here. Boom, boom. Ah, that's a bit hey, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you kidding me? Okay. So we've seen it there, and you've seen that the collective system ha had that ability. But also, what I can do is I can tell, hey, I would like to see it all again. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's going to be playing while I do my other slides. That's <laughs> <laughs> all slides? <laughs> Access to production? No. But the developers want production. They want to see what production looks like. So what we do is we project over into a matrix that brings production into a simulation system and give developers access to the simulation. They can all they can do is kill the simulation, but not production. And great thing about it is that production is elastic, uh, or, or you know. The number of uh, processes doesn't matter because the matrix is always there. By the way, one question, and this is this is excluded from my time because I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> That's on your side. Okay, wait. He's not a developer. He's a marketing guy. This is your weird time. No one question. Okay, so let's say you have an elastic system, and uh, and then you your, 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 your rule your rule says that when there's no request, we don't need any VMs or no or no containers. Yeah, that could be a rule. So then the question is, how do you know the difference between when there is no work needed and that's why you have no containers, or all your containers are gone, they're dead? No. You don't know the difference because there's no way to answer that question. Why? Because you haven't got, your containers at the moment are your body. They represent it and they represent your application. So when you say monitor an application, you're saying processes. But what happens when you have no body, but you still had a conscious? You have this consciousness. You need to separate the mind and the body. And that's why the simulation is the machine's mind. So the, we need, the simulation will be the mind of the machines. And you know what, every time we start up a new machine, what happens? It becomes, it's a new, it's a new beginning. But with the simulation, it can actually connect, get its old, its memories back and say, oh, I remember. And I remember how to fly a helicopter. Because it was dreaming. I can feel the dreams. I can feel the dreams. So I can see all my slides. I just saw it. So, okay, one last thing. One last thing. I went to Microsoft and said, Do you remember Clippy? And they said, I don't want to talk to you again. And I said, Well, what we can do is for every operating system should have mini me processes. So for every real process, there's a little process that's mimicking it. So he's like, I'm doing what you're doing. And he keeps dancing, yeah? And what happens when Word crashes? I said to Microsoft, when Word crashes, it will be mini-Word, and he'd be like, 
This is what I was doing just before a crash. So we can actually get diagnostics because the simulation doesn't crash. It only mimics the moments before the crash and it's frozen at that time. It's, and it's waiting for you to reconnect. Is it that expensive? No, no, because... No, don't stop. <laughs> Because I'm now bringing this, I'm putting new code into a simulation. Yeah? So I can actually, wait, wait, no press. Oh, <laughs> But what if machines could see like us? I, so a lot of what we communicate, I can just simply watch. There's no one, when I look at you, you're not sending me a packet. Here's a packet, go on, get it. And I'm like, oh, what the hell does that say? Or is it a header, does it? No, it's body? Not. I'm not, I'm, I'm observing you. So I take, and what I do is I project the image over into the machine, I see what you're doing, and I sense who you are. Okay, so that's anytime computing, change, space and time. In flight simulation, you come into production the first day, you sit in a flight simulator, and you go through shit. all of the incidents, yeah, all the shit that happened in the last six months, you relive it in, in an era. You just sit there, and what happens is you watch it again and again until you train your own memory to recognize that production is just about to fail. That's so this is Groundhog Day, yeah. So that's what we can do. We can have flight simulation for operation, and it's going to feel real. It's going to feel real because it, to, to every to monetary tools, the machines look real. Um. <laughs> Effect of, the, of both the programs, and it happened just because it was a uh, context switch, as you know, to be a scheduling. You cannot remember a lot of ways. No, 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 no. Well, not no, 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 no. But there is a timing. We do have that, but yeah, probably not down to the nanosecond. But this, the agent itself is using the hyperparameter to actually get the data. Okay, so that's the other thing. Yeah, yeah. But this is a little bit different. Because we have trading environments where we have a computational system that's mimicking uh, the software exchanges. And I was like, okay, why not just, why can that just not be done? Actually, what happened was that the customer said, listen, we don't want to impact production. And we want this data collection. How can we put the data collection in, but not impact production? And I came up, well, let's have it in another system with more capacity. And then I started to move it over. So, okay, then I'm gonna move the code that's in the monitoring agent over into the simulation. So, but it, a lot of the time you can, you can see. I mean, over time, you, it's, you know, there's enough, there's always a hint of the problem in there. And remember, every time you look at it, the great thing about, like, when you when you have a memory, is that every time you look at it again and again, you see something different. It's a bit like looking at a movie. You see an actor in the background, but you didn't see the first time. So in production, always, like, you have to monitor everything. But when you're able to look at a movie again and again and again, and the feel is real, you see the other things that's happening around that just because your brain is already saying, ignore that because I found that I'm interested. So we're also, it's a way of us seeing machines in a, that we can actually see them not be robotics. Yeah. Can you do something like, uh, I uh, capture the data of a program running and then I try to replicate like 10 times that program on the same machine to simulate? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. You can actually replay them all. There's, there's, no, there's no limit that they, they can't, all the machines can't be running at the same time again and again. Dreams have to be space. 
Yeah, but they're in the same, yeah, they're in the same process. But the processes themselves are like containers, so they just can all recreate the same thing. So you can actually put it in, and what one customer done was he used that to actually inject. So they took a recording for production, and they said, we want to do performance testing. And they actually recorded production, and then in the playback, they hooked into the simulation, because the simulation can't affect the world, it's immutable. The world is just a simulation. It's a bit like 13 floor floor, where we have a simulation within the simulation. And by the way, the universe, we mathematicians believe, some mathematicians believe that we're in a simulation ourselves. So, and that we create simulations and the simulation. So why not? It is. And what was the other? <laughs> Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not.